so acid precipitation is just anything that's coming from the atmosphere that has acidic has an acidic ph and we create that with the activities on the earth's surface with our factories and and vehicles that are transmitting a lot of pollution and certain chemicals promote acid rain formation sulfur and nitrogen com containing compounds are part of that so we really need to be aware of fossil fuels. And again, when someone says, oh, we're moving this factory into our town, it's gonna to be great for jobs, great for the economy. That's all true, and that's an important consideration as Americans. We need to have an economy, right? We need people to have jobs and not high rates of unemployment. But we have to think about what is the impact of that factory going to be on the environment. And that's where you just ask questions. I'm not saying this is not a political class. I'm not one of those that touts my political beliefs to my students. I think that's inappropriate for instructors. Unless it's a political science class, then maybe you can examine both sides. But um, it's just something to consider. It's where you would ask questions. Is what is the impact of that factory on the environment? What type of fuels are being burned, what, is the, what products are going to be entering the air, and you'd want to ask those questions because acid rain is real and does occur. So I want to show you just a brief video about acid rain. Watch that. I have to make sure my sound is on. I think I turned it off. What is acid rain? Acid rain is any form of precipitation with high levels of nitric and sulfuric acids. It can occur in the form of snow, fog, and even dry materials that settle to earth. Most acid rain is caused by human activities. When people burn fossil fuels, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides are released into the atmosphere. These gases react with water, oxygen, and other substances to form sulfuric and nitric acid. Winds may spread these acidic solutions over hundreds of miles. After it falls to earth, acid rain enters water systems as runoff and sinks into the ground. This can make water toxic to crayfish, clams, fish, and other aquatic animals. The rest of the food chain, including non-aquatic species such as birds, is often affected as well. Acid rain also harms forests by damaging trees' leaves, robbing the soil of essential nutrients, and making it hard for trees to take up water. By designing cleaner power plants and using fewer fossil fuels, we can reduce the number of pollutants that create acid rain. So again, we're just looking at finding ways to use um, less fossil fuels like wind energy, solar energy, All those, you know, alternative fuel sources are important to consider. Like we just built a home recently, and I was looking. It's a larger home. I didn't want it to be as big as it turned out to be, but it did. Um, so we are looking at how are what are ways to reduce energy usage in this large home as we retire and kids move out. And we decided to put in a geothermal system. And when I told people about the geothermal heating and air conditioning system, they're like, "Oh, that's so expensive." But when you research it, the, um, right now they're giving tax credits back. So they're, they're paying you back for the money you put in to install, install this system. And um, you get rebates from your electric company, which makes a difference. And the savings on your monthly heating bill adds up to where it pays for itself in only three years. So that's huge. And some people, you know, they're like I asked my mother what her heating bill was. She built a brand new house just a couple years ago, and her heating bill in the winter time is over $300. People with geothermal systems, their heating bill is less than $100. So that's significant because what it does is it uses water. It uses water from below the ground that, regardless of the season, the water below ground is about between 50 and 60 degrees. So when you're air conditioning 
on a 90 degree day, you're trying to air condition that air from 90 down to 20, right? And it's constant. But what geothermal does is it brings that water in at 60 degrees, maybe a little more in the summertime, it raises a little bit, but you're, you're dropping the temperature a lot less. And it's a constant flow of this air. You're not constantly taking 90 degree air and converting it into 70 degree air. You're taking this 60 to 70 degree air and just raising it to wherever it's comfortable, but it's a constant flow. So you're using less electricity. Same thing with warming it. When you take a, a day like today that's 20 degrees and you want it to be 70 in your house, you have to heat that air to 50 degrees higher, right? But if it's coming in through water, geothermal, you're only heating it from 60 to 70, 10 degrees. That's a lot less energy. So something to think about, you know, when you guys get older and look into building a home or looking at homes and someone tells you it has a geothermal system, a lot of people don't know about it and they'll criticize it only because they don't know about it. But if you actually do the research on it, it is a definitely a valuable way to save on energy costs and burning less fossil fuels. So if my furnace is running less, I'm burning less LP gas from my tank out in the yard, I'm using less fossil fuels as a result of that and I'm contributing to the overall health of our planet by doing that. Same thing with your vehicles. I get talked about trucks. You know, some people need trucks, so I'm not criticizing everybody who has a heavy-duty truck because construction workers need heavy-duty trucks. But if a person's just going to commute to work and back and they have a desk job, to have a big heavy-duty truck to take to, to work and back, maybe not a good idea. Maybe they could have the heavy-duty truck but drive a small compact car to and from work just to save on gas and burning less fossil fuels. So that's the end of the topic on the chemistry of life. We're going to switch gears now and talk about the molecules of life, which is like organic chemistry. So molecules, the, the organic molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, what they all have in common is that they contain carbon. And carbon is the most abundant atom in living things. So everything you take in as food is an organic molecule and contains carbon. So we know, right, proteins, fats, sugars, carbohydrates are sugars, those are important parts of our diet. And some people, you know, are constructing diets where they kick out the carbohydrates, right, and they just rely on fat and protein, that's like the ketogenic diet. So a lot of people are familiar with these molecules, but we're going to really analyze them as they apply to biology. So the first one we're going to talk about today are carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are sugars, so that's the key word you want to underline or highlight is that they are sugars. And we have three different categories of carbohydrates. We have monosaccharides, which we call simple sugars. And we tested for those, one of those in lab yesterday. Do you remember what test we used? Yeah, yeah, the Benedict's test, yeah, we did that in lab. So the simple sugars are the ones that are readily available for quick fuel for cells. So cells can use these simple sugars and, and make ATP very quickly with them and, and have lots of energy. So when you eat simple sugars, we're talking monosaccharides, disaccharides. And the simplest are the monosaccharides because it's one sugar unit. Then polysaccharides are uh, simple sugars in long chains. So they're bonded, covalently bonded. So all organic molecules are bound together by covalent bonds. Their basic structure is formed by covalent bonds. So they're chains of carbon with some oxygen and hydrogen in different arrangements. So the monosaccharides are the simplest. Glucose is the most common monosaccharide. That's what our cells use for energy. So when you eat your Mountain Dew, or drink your Mountain Dew, um, eat a Snicker bar, suck on some hard candy, you're breaking that sugar down into glucose. Even if you eat a bowl of pasta, which is made up of polysaccharides, complex carbohydrates, your digestive tract breaks it down into glucose because that's what your cells can use and absorb. Bigger carbohydrates are too big, so we need to break them down, break those bonds into the smallest carbohydrates. And in the human body, it's, it's um, glucose. So, for example, if a person is lactose intolerant, they cannot break down the sugar lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide. So, therefore, it goes through the digestive tract undigested because they lack the enzyme to break the bond in lactose to break it down into its monosaccharide components. And then they end up with bloating and gas, maybe diarrhea, stomach upset. 
it's a bad deal for people that have lactose intolerance. So when we look at the three monosaccharides, <clears throat> they are glucose, fructose, and galactose. Fructose is a fruit sugar. So when you eat an apple or an orange, the sugar sweet taste in that uh, apple or orange is fructose, and that is also useful you know, for quick energy. It's a simple sugar. It's one sugar unit. Notice that they all have a similar chemical structure, and that's the simplest of sugars. So our cells can use that without any energy. We just absorb that and use it. So if someone's on like life support and they're getting their energy through their IV, it's totally not going in the digestive tract, we're putting in simple sugars because it doesn't need to be digested. And the simple sugar we use in um, the healthcare setting is dextrose. So that's a very it's a similar sugar to glucose and our cells can use that readily for energy. So disaccharides are two sugar units bonded together. Notice there's an oxygen in between the two. So when we break that bond, that's what enzymes are doing in the digestive tract. So when you eat something sugary, like a Mountain Dew, a sugary Mountain Dew, your body has to digest that sucrose. It's in the form of corn syrup, right? Um, you have to break that bond to release glucose and let your cells absorb it. So lactose, like I said, there's an enzyme called lactase that breaks the bond between those two ringed monosaccharide structures. So there's a, a, an enzyme, lactase, that breaks this bond and allows us to absorb those two individual sugar units. So there's an enzyme you can buy in the grocery store, right? It's called lactate. And even some milk products are, they contain the enzyme right in the milk, so people can drink the milk and the enzyme's right in there and they don't have any issues. Like my daughter has had friends over and, you know, will say, oh, we're going to stop at Dairy Queen. And then her friend will say, well, I didn't bring my, my pill, so I can't go to Dairy Queen. So if you've ever noticed after eating ice cream that you have stomach upset, it might be that you're lactose intolerant. And it does develop as we age. So People, when they get over the age of 40, find that they're less um, able to digest lactose than when they were younger. Or some kids are born with it. Like if we were told you had colic as a baby, sometimes that's an intolerance to lactose. So polysaccharides then are many sugar units bonded together. And there's four polysaccharides you need to know for biology. Cellulose is the sugar that we find in plants. The bad part about cellulose for us is that we can't digest it. So cellulose is the structural sugar in plants. It what's for, it's what keeps the stem upright. It gives the leaves its crunchy structure. So when you're chewing on celery, for example, you're chewing that crunchy sound you get is from the cell walls of those vegetables that contain cellulose. We call that roughage in our diet. So it passes right through the digestive tract unabsorbed. So we, the energy, all those sugar units that contain energy for cells are not usable by us. We can't break the bonds between these sugar units in cellulose. So right here, these bonds, we do not have the enzymes in our gut to break that cellulose apart. So it just passes right through and makes for healthy bowel movements. If you don't eat any fruits or vegetables fresh, cooking breaks down the cellulose and does not contribute to roughage in the diet, but People that talk about a high fiber diet, they're eating cellulose. Cellulose is a, is a part of their diet. It's an important part of our diet. And fruits and vegetables can be expensive, right? People say that's the reason why they don't eat healthy is because fruits and vegetables are expensive. Well, it depends on the fruit and vegetable. A bag of apples, depending where you shop at, Woodman's, for example, are not very expensive. Um, carrots are pretty low cost. So those are some things that we could incorporate in our diet as college students that are not overly expensive. A great snack in college to, to tell yourself, gosh, I'm, I'm eating better, I'm not guilty after eating this snack, is carrots and peanut butter. Those are two relatively inexpensive things and it tastes good if you have a little bit of a sweet tooth but you also need some roughage in your diet, carrots and peanut butter. Um, celery and peanut butter, celery and cream cheese, those are good things that we can eat as college students that don't break the budget. So the next one is starch. Starch is also a plant carbohydrate, polysaccharide, many chains of, of uh, simple sugar units, but that we can digest. So when we eat starches, we're getting the energy from those foods. So starches include, and that's the storage carbohydrate for plants. So when plants 
plants have cellulose for their cell walls and for structure. But when they make excess glucose from the sun for, with photosynthesis, they store that excess glucose as starch. So it's kind of like the plant fat, but it's not fat. It's a carbohydrate, but it's a storage sugar for that plant. So we know that potatoes contain starch, right? Potato plants are really good at making these big structures, which we'll talk about later, that store lots of starch, right? We know wheat is a good source of starch, right? We see that in our breads, pastas. We know rice is another starch. So we have these, these food sources we rely on in the human diet that are really starch-based. But we know that carbohydrates in general are easy to digest. Toast, you know, bagels, crackers, all those good things we like um, are good sources of energy. When you eat those things, you feel like you have energy because it raises blood sugar very quickly. The, the, the time it takes to cleave those sugar units off by the digestive enzymes you have in your gut is very short, so we get quick energy from that. The bad part about that is when we digest it and absorb it, our stomach is empty quicker too, isn't that true? When you eat something that's basically carbs, like you eat a bowl of pasta or potatoes or crackers or bread, because you're hungry, right? Your body digests it very quickly, you absorb the glucose into your blood and the food is gone in your stomach and then pretty soon your stomach is shrinking down and telling you that you're hungry again. So the bad part about eating carbohydrates in our diet, where there's a lot of it and it's mostly what you eat, is that you're gonna feel hungry more often because they're digested so quickly. Those enzymes break those bonds so quickly. So it gives you good energy, but then you're hungry again. So that's why we need fats and, and proteins in our diet because it takes a little longer to digest those things and you get more energy for the long term. Because when you eat a lot of carbohydrates, it's like a tidal wave of sugar into our bloodstream and then your pancreas secretes a lot of insulin to let that glucose into your cells and then as the pancreas secretes a lot of insulin and all that sugar goes into cells, what happens to blood sugar? Drops back down again because you had a wave of insulin to push all that sugar into your cells, then blood sugar drops and then how do you feel? Hungry, cranky, tired, and then what do you go for? More carbs, right? And that's where people get on this addiction to carbohydrates, that they're craving sandwiches and pizzas and macaroni and cheese and pastas, all those feel-good foods, right? And it's good in moderation, but if you throw some healthy fats and proteins in there, you're gonna have an, uh, a more even energy level and you're not gonna be thinking about, what am I gonna eat next? I see students sometimes, not in this class, but and some of my other classes that are constantly snacking every day of the week. I have them in class, whether it's lab or lecture, they're constantly snacking. I see them in the halls, they're constantly snacking and it's all carbohydrates. And that is, you know, there's carbohydrate addictions out there. If you find yourself struggling to, to avoid those foods that you know are bad for you, carbohydrate laden foods, we get dependent on that. The brain likes the reward system of that rush of glucose into the blood. Same thing with our, you know, drinking sugary sodas. You like the caffeine, the brain likes the caffeine, but it also likes the sugar. So let's talk about the next one, glycogen. Glycogen is our storage molecule. When we get excess glucose coming into the body, which is because of all the carbs we eat, the excess is stored as glycogen. So we, in our liver and muscle, we have glycogen stores, little shelves for those cells to store glycogen, excess sugar. So we, we take the sugar floating around in the, in the blood and we make these long chains of glycogen stored in the liver and muscle, which is great. But we have a limited storage. So picture you have all these glucose, all these cans of soup, let's say glucose is cans of soup. You have all these cans of soup, all this glucose, you go to your pantry, which is your liver or muscle cell, and you wanna fill the glycogen stores, the, the shelves are full. What happens to the excess glucose then when we fill our glycogen stores in liver and muscle? What does it turn to? Fat. So that's why a person who has developed muscles has more glycogen stores. So when they eat something that's 1,000 calories, let's say uh, two slices of pizza, which is about 1,000 calories, they eat those two slices of pizza and they've got this excess glycogen from the crust of that pizza they have more glycogen stores to put that excess glucose, so less is stored as fat. So that's why they talk about 
you know, for just average weight loss, a little bit of a weight training program building your muscles is going to increase glycogen stores, raise your metabolism, and less glucose that you eat is stored as fat. So if you don't, if you're someone who doesn't like getting on the treadmill and doing, you know, aerobic activity where you're sweating and gasping, that's not what exercise needs to be. Even just a simple weight training, you know, light weight training can increase glycogen stores and raise your metabolism. So something to think about. It doesn't take as much time either to lift weights, I think, and you can do a circuit of good weightlifting in 20 minutes. You don't have to be on a treadmill for an hour. So that's glycogen. So when people do carb loading, athletes before uh, an event, carb loading is you know, a good thing to do. Eating a lot of carbs, filling the glycogen stores the day or two before an event. So when they get to that event, say it's a marathon the next day or half marathon, and they've depleted their blood sugar, they've depleted their ATP, they're gonna start uh, delivering glucose to the blood by breaking those glycogen bonds. The, between the glucose units. So they're gonna be able to go the distance compared to someone who doesn't train and doesn't have higher glycogen stores, they're not gonna be able to go the distance because their blood sugar is gonna drop. And then lastly, chitin, this is the storage carbohydrate. It's more stru it's structural also, and this is found in insects. The crunchy sound you hear when you step on the exoskeleton of an insect, that's chitin that forms that exoskeleton. So that's where we find that, is in the exoskeleton of insects. We also find it is the structural sugar in a mushroom. What allows a mushroom to be upright and fry it in the pan and you chew on that rubbery texture of a mushroom? That's chitin, that's the storage, or not the storage. It does contain some energy, not a lot, but that's the structural um, polysaccharide of a fungus because they're not green, they don't have cellulose, so they have chitin. So these are all examples of polysaccharides. So again, starch, here's the storage molecules here of starch. So that's for energy for the plant and for anything that eats the plant, right? And then here's glycogen, this is an animal cell, and we have these glycogen granules floating around in the cytoplasm as storage and ready to release glucose if necessary. And then again, cellulose, we cannot break that bond. So this bond here, we cannot break, so that's why it's a structural protein. But cows can, right? That's all cows do is munch on grass. Herbivores have the enzymes to break down cellulose, and it's a big part of their diet. That's where they get their energy from. So deer, you know, cows, termites, right? Termites can digest cellulose in the wood of our home foundation. So if you ever buy a home, make sure that you request a, a home inspection, which they go and look for termites. So termites are a big problem around here and everywhere. Um, some people get so excited, they see a really cheap house, it's really in bad repair. And you know the price is so good that people will say, yeah, we'll just buy it. And, you know, in the realtor be like, well, do you want a home inspection, or you can just buy it as is, and you know you can get in sooner. We can close right away if you don't want a home inspection. I had a student who did that, and she's like, yeah, we want it. We want it. It was a house in Toma, and they bought it, and they found out the entire foundation was turning to powder because of termites. So the entire home needed to be lifted up with a new foundation, and it cost fifty thousand dollars, and they only paid. 90 for the house. So what they thought was a great deal was not a good deal, ended up costing more than the house was worth. And they were stuck with it, so they had to do the repair. So always do a home inspection. Another horror story I heard is someone was ripping out a bathroom and discovered all black mold after they took the paneling off in the bathroom. So that was a health hazard and it couldn't even be lived in until they had a special company that comes and resolves black mold infection in homes. So you really got to be careful. Don't let your your judgment be clouded by a good deal, especially when it comes to homes because things are hidden that you don't know are, are there. <clears throat> so again, we look at chitin. It's found in the exoskeleton. It's also used to make surgical thread. So the next uh, major organic molecule are fats. So fats have two structural components, fatty acids and glycerol. You've heard of fatty acids before, right? That's the part that's important for our diet. We have omega-6 
fatty acids, right? And omega-3 fatty acids. Do you know which one is better for you? Do you ever see them on your vitamin pills or on nutritional labels? Do we like omega-6 or omega-3? Yeah, very good. Omega-3. And what's a popular source of omega-3 fatty acids in our diets? Do you know where you would go to find those? Fish. Fish. Yep. Fish have it. How about plants? Yes. Flaxseed. Flaxseed's a good source of omega-3. Olive oil is a good source of omega-3. Avocados, if you like avocados, those are a good source. One of the top healthiest foods are avocados. They contain those healthy fats. So when you think of fats, it's not like you want to avoid them. Omega-3s are really important. They're important for brain function. They found that people who take fish oil have better retention and brain function. So if you're someone who um, needs a little boost in the brain power area, try some um, omega-3s. Like if you're stressed, you know, that's hard on the brain. And people that are stressed, pregnant women, their brain actually shrinks as baby takes all the nutrients from the blood of the mother. So they say that fish oil actually can boost the cognitive functioning of the mother as well as boost the brain development of the baby. I learned that in my sixth pregnancy. And I was teaching, and I used to get what they call pregnancy brain. When I was teaching, I'd be talking, and all of a sudden I'd forget a common word that I've taught over and over and over. All of a sudden I can't come up with it. Did you ever have that? You know, you can't think of a friend's name or someone at work or whatever. I used to do that all the time when I was teaching, and it was really frustrating for me. Well, when the, with the sixth pregnancy, they said that we should take, you know, fish oil. So I did, and I, I was like on fire that semester. I remember I could just, everything was right there, and I had no issue with that at all. So it's a good idea you know, to take those if you feel like your diet might be deficient in that. Another thing we don't know, or maybe you don't know, are that omega-6s are another type of fatty acid that we see in our diet. And we find that in fried foods, like vegetable oils, things that are fried in vegetable oil. Um, those are bad for our diet. They actually promote inflammation in the body, where omega-3s decrease inflammation in the body. So I find fish oil helps my joints and I feel better. Um, I even went to the dentist one time and she said, wow, your gums look really good. Didn't do anything different. It was the fish oil. And I even said, I think it's because I'm taking fish oil. And I had been taking it for a couple of months at that point. It takes a while to feel the benefits, a couple months, but it was definitely worth it. Um, but omega-6s on the other hand, we have, we see a lot of omega-6s in donuts, pizza, chips, french fries, all those fried foods that are a big part of the American diet and big part of the college student diet, right? Because it's readily available. The Quick Trip Hotspot has all those wonderful omega-6s that we can take part in eating. And it's great in moderation, but take a note of how you feel after you eat some of those foods. You might find that you feel kind of ugh after you eat it. Your energy level, I mean, if you're really hungry, you're going to benefit from the carbs in that. But those omega-6 fatty acids, sometimes people even find they get a headache after eating some of those foods because they just don't feel well. So omega-3s are where we want to look for those fatty acids in some of those healthier sources. Like if you're going to make eggs, try it in olive oil. You'll notice that it's not a big taste difference, frying eggs in olive oil, even though it looks a little weird if you buy some that are really green. Um, but it's, it's a pretty good taste. Making hash browns in olive oil instead of vegetable oil, it's no difference in taste. So, and I know coconut oil is becoming really popular, um, but it has a kind of a coconut flavor to it, at least what I've noticed. So um, you have to be careful what you cook that in or what you cook in it. So anyway, the unsaturated fats are those that come from plant sources. So those are the healthier choice versus saturated fats. When you eat a hamburger and you look at the raw burger, all those little white dots are fat, right? So when you put the burger on the pan, those white dots melt and become liquid in the bottom of the pan, and that's liquid fat. So when it solidifies, it's, it's animal fat, and it's saturated fats. It contributes to high cholesterol, it contributes to heart disease, all things we want to avoid. So what can you do? It's a simple thing you can do. It doesn't cost any money. And unfortunately, I clogged the pipe draining our house in West Salem, doing too much of this, and people were quite upset. <laughs> I'll tell you how that happened in a minute. What would be the easiest thing to do to get the fat off of your burger that you just fried in the pan to make tacos? Drain it. What's the, even, what's the next step if you really want to reduce the fat? What do you do to get fat off of stuff? 
rinse it with hot water. Rinse that burger with hot water and you'll reduce that fat content down considerably. I told my daughter she likes to do beach body diet, which is really healthy cooking. I told her, you know, you're buying this ground round that has less fat in it, which is like five bucks a pound versus this other burger that is less per pound. Rinse off the cheaper burger and you've just made the more expensive burger, right? Because you got rid of the fat by cooking it, rinsing it with hot water. Well, here's what I did wrong. I rinsed it with hot water, but I didn't let the hot water run long enough. I think someone came in and was running cold water. So this big liquid mass of fat that was going down into our basement pipe solidified into a big white mass. And then pretty soon it was coming up and it plugged the the thing in the plug the pipe in our basement and there was this brown gook coming from underneath. I was gone at the time, the kids talked about it, my husband was there. So this guy, he was so great, I called up this plumber friend who said call this guy, he does pumping and deals with this problem. He came in, it was 10 o'clock at night on a Saturday night. I mean, talk about nice. He came with his son from his house to our house, 10 o'clock at night on a Saturday night and pumped it out and he reaches his hand down in there into the gook and smells it. He says, it smells like burger. Somebody been cooking hamburger meat recently? And my husband asked me, and I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I made a couple of casseroles, tacos. I was just making a lot of burger and freezing it. So if you do that, my take home message is make sure you run a lot of hot water afterward. Otherwise, we'll have major issues with clogged pipes. So if it comes from an animal, if it's an animal fat, it's an unhealthy source of fat, so we really have to watch that. Rinsing our burger, choosing low-fat meats, like on a chicken. What do chickens do best, fly or run? Run, so the cells in the legs of a chicken have a lot of fat because it needs to fuel all that activity. Because they're not flying long distances, they have very little fat in the muscle of the breast that supports the wings and the movement of the wings, so therefore, Chicken breast has low fat, and that's a better choice for your protein sources, right? What about ducks? Do you see long flights with ducks just going long distances? Definitely, they migrate, right? So what do we know about duck breast? It's definitely fatty. All of a duck is fatty because they you know, paddle in the, in the streams and the lakes, and they also fly long distances, so it's a fattier meat. So chicken breast is a good choice for a low-fat meat, if you're going to eat a saturated fat. But if we can go to the unsaturated fats, that's best. So the function of, what do we say the function of carbs were? Yep, quick fuel, quick fuel. Function of fats is energy storage. So our bodies are selfish when it comes to excess calories, whether we're bringing them in as carbs, fats, or proteins. Anytime we have excess calories in our diet, we're never gonna pee away calories. Like we pee away other excesses, like excess fluid, excess salt. We get rid of all that stuff. We're not gonna do that with glucose. Any excess glucose that remains after digestion gets stored as fat. Well, it fills our glycogen stores first. So again, if you have more glycogen stores, less is available for fat, but everything else is for fat because it's there as a go-to in case there's a famine. And the human body is designed to resist famine at all costs. So the more we take in, the more calories are of excess and the more we store as fat. So, but the benefit of fat is that it cushions vital organs as well. For example, um, our kidneys have a, a rich source of fat around them to protect them because they don't have a bony covering, right? Our kidneys are on the back wall just above your hips, so there's a nice fatty covering around them. So when you look at fatty acids, they're long chains of carbon and hydrogen. This is what a fatty acid looks like, bonded to glycerol. So if we look at here we see three fatty acids bonded to glycerol. So this is called a triglyceride because it has three fatty acids bonded to glycerol and that's what body fat is. So the chemical structure of body fat is a triglyceride. And that's what is in our animal fats. And that's it. if you go to the doctor and get your cholesterol level checked, they're gonna run a profile and tell you what your triglyceride levels are. And that just tells how much fat is freely floating in your blood. If you have a high fat diet, you're gonna have triglycerides fl freely floating in your blood that haven't been um, processed yet. So it's important that we limit that. 
So cheese, you know, high fat dairy like milk. You know, we have 2% milk, 1% milk, skim milk, whole milk, right? Adults should not be drinking whole milk. There's absolutely no reason to drink whole milk unless a person is trying to gain weight and has, you know, low calorie intake. Sometimes we like the taste of whole milk. We think more fat is better, right? And if that's you, try 2%. See if you like it a little better. Or if you're a 2% kind of person, try 1%. I feel the biggest leap is going from 1% to skim because skim is pretty significantly, um, well, it's, lo it's low fat, no fat, right? But it is, has a different taste, quite a different taste. So, but it's always worth trying. Another type of important fat in our bodies is not just the fat under our skin, but the fat that makes up our cell membranes. This is called a phospholipid. And you're gonna learn about this more in the next unit, but what you need to know now is that phospholipids are found in the plasma membrane, in the cell membrane. Our whole cell is surrounded by these phospholipids, which protects it from the outside because not everybody can pass through an oily layer, right? Because we know water and oil don't mix. So therefore, our cell membranes are not permeable to anything that wants to pass in or out. So here's what the cell membrane looks like. It's this layer of phospholipid molecules, and it has the tail part. These are the, the, the center yellow part. These are all fatty acids. And the rounded part is the phosph phosphorus-containing um, end, which, which is charged, so it attracts things to the surface of our cells. But in order to get through this oily middle layer, it either has to be something that dissolves in oil, which would be like carbon dioxide, oxygen, or, or gases can dissolve right, right through. Alcohol and nicotine can dissolve right through. But things like glucose needs a transporter. And insulin is part of that transport, allowing the, the receptor for glucose to allow glucose into the, into the cell. Another type of fats we see that are important in the body are steroids. And steroids, you've heard of, people take steroids to get big muscles, right? The, the steroid they're referring to is testosterone. Testosterone is an enhancement that people can take that are weightlifting because it promotes protein synthesis in the muscle. So that's a type of steroid, it's just one of them. So they're referring to testosterone when they're talking about you know, anabolic steroids for competition. But there's a lot of other important steroids. Cholesterol is part of the plasma membrane. We're gonna talk about that. But if you notice, progesterone, um, estradiol, that's estrogen, so that's female hormones. Cortisol, that's for long-term stress management. Aldosterone is for fluid balance. But if we look at all of these, what do they all have in common? that ABCD, that four ring structure, that's unique to steroids. So if on a test you saw a picture of this molecule and you saw the four ring structure, you would tell me that that is a steroid, right? So be able to identify basic structures of these molecules. Remember the sugar units were the, the ring structures with the oxygen in the middle? The fatty acids were the long tails, so the phospholipids had the, the heads with the two long tails. Triglyceride had three long tail of uh, fatty acids. Not tails necessarily, but, so again, two fatty acids with a phosphate, that's a phospholipid. Body fat triglycerides have three fatty acids with this chain here, this base of glycerol. Okay, so those are the fats. Again, triglycerides, phospholipids, and steroids are the major groups within the category of fats. So a lot of these are hormones. Proteins, the next group, these are hugely important to the body. They not only provide most of our structure, but also a lot of the functions in the body are due to protein action. For example, Collagen, have you ever heard of collagen before? Collagen is a structural protein in our skin and in our joints and tendons and in our muscles and there's other places as well. So when people get sagging skin, it's because of collagen breaking down in their skin. So people get collagen injections and if you look at people that have had facelifts and, and injections of collagen, they have this rigid face that doesn't really move anymore but it doesn't sag so they're happy with that. But 
um, it's, it's a structural protein. We also see collagen in our bone. So your bone is somewhat flexible because of collagen, but it also has calcium phosphate to make it hard. But it's a structural protein keeping your, your bone intact and not having a break and be brittle from just calcium phosphate. And then we have proteins that make up our muscle. We have two proteins called actin and myosin that make up the bulk of muscle. So all of those things are important structural and functional because muscle has a function of movement. Your antibodies that you produce when you're exposed to something foreign, those are all proteins. Enzymes that are driving all the chemical reactions for metabolism, those are all enzyme, or, or those are all proteins. So enzymes are proteins. So hugely important. So therefore, your body doesn't like to use protein as a nutrient source as the first go-to nutrient source. The body likes fatty acids and glucose as a nutrient source. Then it'll go to proteins. So it's still good. We need protein in our diet because we need protein to make protein in our cells. So lots and lots of different functions. I'm not going to go through all the individual functions of proteins, but like I said, structural support, so ligaments, tendons, skin, um, transport, that we have transport channels in our cells that are made up of proteins, um, movement with our muscles, antibodies. We'll go through some of these throughout the semester, but these are just examples here. I don't expect you to know specific examples of proteins. Just know that they're really important for structure and function in the body. And again, I do want you to know, obviously, it's in big red letters, so that means it's important and will be on the test. Anytime you have an enzyme, it's a chemical that speeds a chemical reaction, that is a protein. So we need protein to make protein. Again, so if you're someone who eats only carbohydrates and that's it, where do we get the amino acids then for making proteins for antibodies and muscle and collagen? We go after protein in the body. So you'll find that kids who have really high carbohydrate diets and maybe are very thin because they only eat pasta and sandwiches and sugary things, they tend to be thin and they're weak. They have low muscle function because the body is using those muscle sources for energy because if we don't bring amino acids in, there's nothing the body can use other than it's what's already there. So it's going to break down protein in the body to make more protein. So an example of a protein, it's a long carbon chain. It has a nitrogen on one side and a carboxyl group on the other side. So all that you need to recognize, of everything we've talked about so far, carbohydrates and lipids, all you're going to see is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, nothing else. When we get to proteins, we throw a nitrogen in there. So you're going to see a nitrogen in protein. So if you're looking at structural formulas on the test, ignore the ones that don't have nitrogen as being potential proteins, because all proteins have a nitrogen on one end. So here's where we take two proteins and put them together to form, or two amino acids, sorry, two amino acids put together forms a protein. The bond between the H of one amino acid and the OH of another amino acid is called a peptide bond. And what type of bond did we say bonds all organic molecules? I said at the beginning of the class. They're a slightly weaker bond than an ionic bond because we need to be able to digest these in our digestive tract and break them apart. What's the next bond after ionic in terms of strength? Do you remember? Those are the weakest. So this one's in the middle. Ionic is the strongest. Hydrogen are the weakest. In the middle is the what's left. Covalent, yeah. So covalent bonds are what bond these molecules together. So a peptide bond is a special covalent bond that bonds amino acids in a protein. And it starts with a P, peptide protein. Just think of that, bonding amino acids together to make these long chains. And then those chains bond, the side chains bond with each other and form this twisted, not, not purely twisted, but this bent structure which um, determines its function. So peptide, or bond, uh, proteins are very um, dependent on structure and bonding um, within the molecule for its function. So this is a really cool example of how 
proteins bend and interact with each other or even within the molecule itself. There's hydrogen bonding that occurs between side groups and gives a really unique structure. So this spider web is made strictly of protein. Red blood cells have um, a specific shape that allows them to travel single file through our bloodstream. But if they have an abnormal hemoglobin, which is a protein that bonds oxygen and carbon dioxide for transport throughout the body, if there's a mutation in that hemoglobin protein, it causes the red blood cells to take on that flattened shape on the right. It's called a sickle. Some people say it looks like a sickle, which is something that you cut brush with like in a forest. Um, but then what happens is they get clogged in our tiniest of blood vessels. They don't go through single file. When they're nice and round and plump, they go through single file and they feed our tissues with oxygen. But when they're skinny and, and sickle-shaped, they clump up in our tiniest of blood vessels and form clots, and then blood flow to those organs is impaired and people feel weak and their muscles are burning when they're trying to walk around because they're not getting good blood flow. And some people need blood transfusions to, to fix that. And it, it forms that shape when there's low oxygen in the body. Maybe they've got bad lungs or they're hiking or they're at a higher altitude. Whatever would cause low oxygen would cause their red blood cells to take on that shape because the protein hemoglobin is very specific in its shape, in its function. It has to maintain its shape to keep uh, the function what it was designed for. So when we denature a protein, we do something to it. Like when you when you make an egg, how many of you in here have made an egg before? Hopefully most people as part of the American diet, but maybe not everybody. Um, when you put that heat on that egg white, which is all protein, you denature it and it turns into a rubbery white substance, right? Totally different. You'll never get that egg white back into that slimy, see-through, transparent protein because you damaged it. You denatured it. So when we change the, the the structural integrity of proteins, it's called denaturing. If, we, if I gave you a strong acid from the chemistry lab and you poured it into egg white, you would see the same thing. It would cook that egg white because acids also denature proteins. So there's a number of things that denature proteins, not just cooking. Yes? How does it affect what? It changes its function, yeah, and it would affect its nutritional value. Like we denature alcohol to use it as a cleaning agent. So when people drink it, it doesn't give the, I mean, it, it can definitely, people have drank rubbing alcohol before. For example, rubbing alcohol is a type of denatured alcohol, but it doesn't have the same taste and it's, it's horrible, right? It's not, it's toxic in high amounts, but people have drank it, people that are, you know, substance abusers. Um, it, it affects its function. So when you break down proteins, but, but alcohol, we're, we're changing the chemical structure. It's not a, alcohol is not a protein, but we're changing its chemical structure. So yeah, when you change the chemical structure, you change the, the function of that. So when you're, taking, when you're talking nutritional value, what do you mean by that exactly? Like if I take in a food that's been denatured, like if I'd eat raw egg versus cooked egg, yeah, you're changing the function, but you're not changing the structure. You still have amino acids that break down so as a, in, the, in the body. So when I, when I eat that egg, there's still amino acids there that I can use for assembling new proteins in my cells. Is that what you mean? OK, yeah. So yeah, cooking an egg is not any worse than eating a raw egg as far as nutritional value. Some people like raw eggs you know, as a drink because they can get more in, right? It's easier to digest raw eggs, like three or four raw eggs in a big gulp than it is to sit down and eat four cooked raw eggs. It fills up more space in the stomach, right? My brother used to do that when he was um, doing bodybuilding. So we'll pick up next time with nucleic acids, and then we're going to build the DNA molecule together in class. Or there'll be one for you to make at home if you're not in class. <laughs>